Hello everybody and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club part 13 of the history of the gyroplane. In this film we close out the 20th century and see the sun almost set, certainly in the UK at least, on the home built single seat gyroplane. I'm banging the drum again regarding subscriptions so please subscribe to the channel and select alerts because there's going to be really good fresh content It'd be a shame to miss it because it's not something just for gyroplane fans. This is for everybody with an interest in aviation. In the 1990s, not for the first time, would a boom in gyroplane activity be accompanied by the shock at accident rates and a lull while the public reassured itself that it was not the fault of the machine. Before the Second World War, most gyroplanes were flown by pilots who if we're not serving or ex-military pilots, we're wealthy amateurs with the financial means to fund effectively unlimited flying. With the sport gyroplane aimed at the everyman and on a budget, authority had not been alive to issues, especially around pilot training. The term airmanship and being air-minded was not something that the man on the street knew very much about. It was compounded because, unlike the olden days, the machine he was used to, his automobile, had become second nature to operate and so much more reliable. Drivers today checking their oil, water and tyre pressures on a six monthly basis were hardly minded to make daily checks. If you want to get a great insight into the pilot mindset at this time, at least in the West Country, you should read Shirley Jennings's Spinning in the Wind. The link to the book is in the description and it's a fabulous read. But for colour, and for those that may not get the chance to read it, here's a small passage. Machines were rarely attended to unless a breakage was imminent and preventative maintenance consisted of a squirt of WD-40. Field repairs were common and frequently ingenious. Punctured tyres were stuffed with grass or rags, broken split plins substituted by bent nails or bits of wire. The all-consuming need to resolve a problem and get back in the air fueled a resourceful creativity. Checklists were non-existent and pre-fight inspections, such as they were, seemed to consist of checking the fuel level and inflating sagging tyres. It paints a wonderful picture of adventure in a Swallows and Amazons style. But as pilots we should be horrified. Isn't this the cocktail that leads exactly to the fatal outcomes we've been reading about. In fact it did. Unfortunately one of those larger characters was an ex-speedway rider by the name of Chris Julian. Sadly Chris was killed in a gyro glider accident in 1997 when the entire rotor detached. Eyewitness stated that he'd carried out a pre-flight inspection which included the control stick, control rods and teeter bolt but he may have overlooked the rotor head securing bolts and it was just another black for the gyroplane. Julian had also been building an aircraft called the Wombat with Rotax two-stroke power which had been very similar in looks to the Wallace WA-116. Sadly, it too never realised its potential. The RAF 2000 had started to become an interesting aircraft because not only did it offer those in colder climates some comfort because of its cabin, the two-seater offered the prospect of taking a friend flying and the side-by-side -side seating arrangement was obviously more sociable than a tandem. It was now being commonly fitted with a Subaru Flat 4 automotive engine and performance was quite favourable. The CAA-sponsored gyroplanes dynamic study was underway with Glasgow University. That work indicated that the stability of gyroplanes was closely related to the geometry of the thrust lines of the propeller. And where a pitch instability became sufficiently large in amplitude, the rotor may become unloaded and power pushover in which the propeller thrust is the dominant force may occur. In this situation, if the propeller line or the propeller thrust line passes significantly above the centre of gravity, the gyroplane will pitch rapidly nose down. It was something that had been addressed by Ernie Boyette's Dominator a decade before, and there was also 
beginnings of a debate around the fitment of a horizontal tailplane. And we may remember Yuka Tervamaki talking about the same in the 1970s. It was something that was going to be the next disruptor in an already quite disruptive saga as we welcome the new millennium.